Hello and welcome to a, another episode of Podcast on Fifth Ave. I'm Taylor. You're Danny. We're recording Friday evening. We typically record early afternoon, but it feels like it's not safe to do that. While the GM search is ongoing, it se- seems like things are changing hour to hour some in, some days. Uh, I don't I don't think anything's gonna happen by the time this comes out on Saturday. So we're gonna talk about the latest with the GM search, and it sounds like it's Kyle Dubas's job uh, to lose. And it, Elliot Friedman on his thirty two thoughts that came out today, he said that if it sounds like the Penguins are waiting on Dubis, and if Dubis isn't the guy, if he doesn't want the job, which is which is a possibility given his uh, season-ending comments in Toronto about not wanting to move his family, put them through that, then Tampa assistant GM Matthew Darsh uh, has the job. Just how, how do you think this plays out? <laughs> It, it's got to be Dubas the way I see it at this point. I, as as you reported earlier in the week, Dubas was at uh, the Lemieux Complex meeting with Sidney Crosby and some Penguins team personnel. We know um, at least one member of Penguins PR was there as well, probably more. Um, at, at that point, obviously, still nothing has gotten done. But to me, if you're meeting with not only just the, the franchise's top player, but a franchise icon like Sidney Crosby, there's got to be some serious, serious mutual interest there. So I I think, you know, Dubas is maybe trying to get his ducks in a row with his family and things back home and figure out, you know, what that all might look like, the the logistical side of things here. But I I just – I really am under the impression at this point that th- this is Dubis's job. I, I I agree. I feel like this is something that maybe give him the weekend to think it over. Because, I mean, the thing is GM search has been going on for a while now, but for Kyle Dubis, this is very sudden. Because right. it was only, you know, a week ago that he thought, he you know, he wanted to return to Toronto. He thought returning to Toronto was a real possibility. Um, obviously, then being informed his contract was not going to be renewed with Toronto. Uh, changes things pretty quickly and like I said it you know because his original comments on the Leafs clean out a day was that it's either back to Toronto or nothing um, just because he does have a young family and you know moving them and all would, would be tough um, he's I think the word he used was recalibrate he was going to take maybe some time off to recalibrate before coming back but then you know he wasn't fired his contract not being renewed but not you know learning that he wasn't going to be back in Toronto that changes things. But again, that was only like a week ago. So I don't think um, it's a bad sign that it hasn't happened yet because this is all very sudden for Dubas. Yeah, I mean, the, the the comment he I remember him making was that he was going to take a step back from the game if he wasn't back with the Leafs. And he was like, you're not going to see me pop up anywhere like next week. But the thing with that was that was like – his that was on his side right like he that was under the assumption that the Leafs wanted him back and it was him making the decision on on whether he wanted to continue forth with the team when you find out that oh they don't want me back well that obviously changes things right because if you're making the decision that you don't want to do it for your own personal reasons well he went back and told Brendan Shanahan I want to continue forth as the Leafs general manager but by that point Shanahan had already began to consider his other options because and and, you know it I find it a a really fascinating situation because Shanahan told Dubas we would like to have you back and then after Dubas went to the media and basically said he was still kind of on the fence which you know I, I don't necessarily blame Shanahan for coming to the realization that he had to start considering other options at that point. I think, I think you have to, when you're in that position and you hear, you know, the leader of your hockey ops department sounding like they're kind of halfway in halfway out, but it's, it's just crazy to me that Dubas came back to him and all of a sudden he's like, you know, we're going to move in another direction now. So Dubas, I, I don't think anybody should really be holding those comments against him too, because it's a lot different if, you know, it's just some random friend of yours, is in the same situation when all of a sudden they go get another job a week and a half later, you're not going to hold it against them and be like, Oh, I thought you, I thought you were going to stay with the, with the post office. If you weren't going to, I I don't know. I'm just rambling here, but I I don't think we should be holding that against Dubas whatsoever. Yeah. There are only 32 of these jobs in the league. They don't open up that often. So when there is one open like this, you can't, fault do this for being like okay well maybe now i am going to be interested after what he said earlier uh something we have to talk about 
Uh, so it's Friday. On Thursday, Frank Saravalli came out with a report on Daily Faceoff that the NHLPA is reviewing the relationship between Dubis um, and his agent. Uh, it's not it, the the word investigation is not used. It's not that serious. It sounds like the NHLPA got complaints about this, and they're just looking into it to review a potential con- conflict of interest. Now, if you actually look at the details and what they're talking about, it sounds like a big fat nothing. Um, so GMs have their own agents. It's not Dubis doing his own negotiating, you know, with um, Shanahan, Shanahan and the Leafs. Uh, Dubis, his agent is Chris Armstrong, who works for Wasserman, the agency. Um, and then Austin Matthews on Toronto also uses an agent at Wasserman. It's not the same agent. They're two totally different people who just happen to both work for Wasserman. Um, Dubis's agent doesn't represent any players. He's not an NHLPA certified agent. He typically represents golfers. Um, so I, <laughs> and if you if you look into the rules, that's fine. Like nothing, no rules are being broken here. Um, there's a quote from an anonymous um, agent to Sarah Valley. Says that this is clearly prohibited under the regulations. Uh, it is an unwritten, understood, to which just. Clearly prohibited and unwritten, understood. Right away, we're, we're contradicting ourselves there. <laughs> unwritten, understood, and long-standing practice that your guy down the hall doesn't work for the other side. I'd like the NHLPA to launch an investigation and draw their own conclusion. To me, this just sounds like sour grapes. Like, why didn't this come out when Dubis was still in Toronto? No, that's exactly what I was going to say. Like, this comes out less than 48 hours after you report that, like, there's some serious stuff going on between the Penguins and Dubas. The the timing of it all is basically like, oh, we're going to throw this out right now because it sounds like you're about to get a, uh, a new job. So, you know, we'll, we'll throw some bad PR out there for you before that even happens. But uh, e- even then, like – there's a conflict of interest of thinking that that actually is a conflict of interest. Cause you, you think, does that even make sense? I don't know. That no. that makes sense. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't make sense. We'll go with it anyway. But it, if, if he's, if he's managing the Leafs, right. And I, just what would he be conspiring with, with Austin Matthews, right? Like he, he still has a team to build. He's still trying to put him himself in the team in a, in a good spot. He's not going to, handicap himself in a, in a way that's just going to like unfairly benefit the player in that instance. Yeah. I don't, I, I got questions on like our site and in my live queues, like, is this, you know, are the penguins going to maybe walk away from Dubis because of this, or could this be like a holdup? No, I don't, I don't, nothing's going to come of this. There have been actual agents who got GM jobs and no one cares. Actual eight, like uh, Ken Hughes represented players yeah. and then now he's managing the canadians um yeah that's why like, that's everyone thought Latang was going to montreal <laughs> right right like is that not like is some kind of a conflict of interest honestly no i don't think so and this is a big nothing it would be maybe something if uh dubis's agent was austin matthew's agent um that's not allowed but it, we're talking about two totally different agents who just work for the same company and Dubis's agent doesn't represent any players. He typically represents golfers. Maybe there's a joke in there about the GM of the Maple Leafs, GM representing golfers, given his inability to make a pass in the second <laughs> half. <laughs> but uh, it's a big nothing. Um, I'm sure by uh, – there's not much more to talk about here. I'm sure by next week's episode we're going to be talking more about Kyle Dubis uh, GM of the Penguins. I feel like that's yeah. this is, they, they can't they can't drag this out much longer. The draft is coming up. The draft is a little more than a month away at this point. Um, it now it's I don't think you need a GM to be uh, very heavily involved in that stuff. It's not like Hextall knew, knew what was going on in the Russian Junior League or the Swiss Second League. Uh, that's the role of the scouts and the penguin scouts are still around. Um, Director of amateur scouting, Nick Pryor, even though his dad was fired as assistant GM, Nick Pryor is still around and they're, they're working through that. So. 
just because we're loosely on the topic here, can we talk about how funny it is that Hextall or Burke almost guaranteed leaked, quote unquote, leaked the info to Elliot Friedman that if the Maple Leafs had not selected Matthew Nyes in the second round of, I want to say, 2021, uh, that the Penguins would have, because the Penguins had the very next pick, the Penguins would have taken him with that pick. Well, the Penguins have to show for that pick Tristan Bros, who, um, some people are high on him. I am not very high on him at all. Um, but regardless, Matthew Nyes was playing, uh, played a few games in the postseason for the Leafs this year. But how funny, is, like, how does that go two years? You never, ever hear, oh, yeah, the Penguins were going to take this guy with that pick if the Leafs didn't take him. And then all of a sudden, Penguins are in on Dubas. And then it comes out that, oh, well, the Penguins, they, they, they were going to take that guy. We are very smart. Someone just was smarter than us. Well, you no, know, you know what that sounds like is after um, Hextall got hired by the Penguins, Bobby Clark comes out and says like, "Well, um, you know, everyone with the Flyers wanted to take Kale McCarr, yeah. but uh, you know, Hextall, you know, single handedly took Nolan Patrick." And like, yeah, in hindsight, you look at that pick and it's like, okay, Kale McCarr, he went fourth. Um, three teams passed over him, but if you look at like. The rankings from around that time, um, Nolan Patrick was consensus one or two. Um, you knew the top, what was that, Jack Hughes year? No, that um, was the uh, Heischer year. He, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you you knew, we knew the, the top two picks. Um, really, no one no one thought Cal McCarr was top two. Now, if you go up and do a redraft, sure, Cal McCarr goes number one. But yeah. yeah, same thing. That was like r- kind of right after Hextall got hired by the Penguins when Bobby Clark who he's like an advisor for the Flyers, comes out and be like, well, because what? He knows Hextall's not going to come out and refute that. Uh, because Hextall's not the kind of guy to do that. And Bobby Clark just needs to sound like the smartest guy in the room and throw <laughs> Hextall under the bus. It's like, I don't know. But yeah, I, it, a bunch of drama. Um, we're going to take a break. We're going to come back. We're going to get back to some more drama. <laughs> yeah, we're going to talk about... Uh, more Penguins front office stuff, uh, so stay tuned. Right, and we are back. Um, we don't typically talk about uh, reports by other local media. Uh, there's never really a reason to, but when something massive comes out and then we're getting a ton of tweets about it and comments on it, like, why don't you guys have this or that? And, and sometimes you just have to. So it, it, there's a story in The Athletic. It just... Big long, um, I guess you can say hit piece on Hextall and his time in the organization, just kind of ripping him. I wasn't going to say anything about it. There really wasn't a whole lot to say. The The reason I, I'll say I got involved and wrote my own story was one of the excerpts from the story that was going around on Twitter that I saw the most um, was about Teddy Bluger finding out how he got traded by the Penguins. This was during the dad's trip, which, by the way, the players set themselves, So, and it was leading up to the deadline. So trading during the dad's trip, that's kind of the player's own fault. You know, guys are going to get moved. Anyway, it was that Teddy and his dad were out at dinner with the players and the other dads, and then Teddy found out on social media that he got traded. Um, and then he abruptly left, uh, had to be consoled by Sidney Crosby, and then Crosby came back and said, you know, um, the line was like, oh, this isn't how we do things in Pittsburgh. And just, I saw fans sharing that, you know, rip it, like, oh, how could they do this to Teddy? And there are a couple of things in there that just um, sound fishy. The quote to me reads like a, it came from AO3. No one's going to know what that means, but for the two of you that do, they'll think it's funny. Um Teddy Bluger, too well-mannered to be on his phone during dinner. But what actually stood out was I remember when Teddy got traded to Vegas, he did an interview with Vegas reporters the next, the, the next day. And he, the first question is, how did you find out you got traded? And he's like, oh, Brian Burke called me into his room uh, at the hotel. And then when he, um, you know, when he called me and I figured something was up, I figured, you know, I was either getting traded or waived because obviously, you know, McGinn, Kapanen are getting waived all this time. They're obviously trying to shake up the bottom six. And he's like, you know, I figured something was up. So I just hoped I was going somewhere good, which right away should tell you that he 
did not find out on social media at a dinner um, when Burke calling him in. He didn't even know for sure if it was a trade. But anyway, I find that video, sent it to Day, and Day is tweeting it. And then everyone's arguing, fans, people in the media, about like, okay, maybe both things can be true. I was like, why don't I just call Teddy up? Um, you can do that. It's a game day in Vegas. Um, what was that game for? I just texted him. I was like, hey, very sorry for texting you on the game day. But just real quick. And he's like, oh, no worries. And then I just got um, a long paragraph back with like, started out like, yeah, that's not accurate at all. And then he just told me the story. Um, first of all, the, whatever restaurant was named in the article was not even right. It was a different restaurant. It was not a steakhouse. It was a sushi place. And then... Uh, Teddy was never even at that dinner. They were supposed to go out to dinner. Um, they got to the team hotel right away. Burke pulls him aside, says like, hey, can uh, you meet me up in my room? Bring your dad. Um, Teddy gets up there. It's Mike Sullivan and Burke. Burke tells Teddy. That's how Teddy finds out. Um, Teddy said he and his dad stopped by the restaurant before leaving just to say goodbye to people. But yeah, he said totally inaccurate, which was not that story so i i write that um dayan did his own thing uh where he talked to people just uh, kind of breaking down how things went um with hexall ownership and how he's kind of unraveled there we just talk about those points um hexall dayan writes hexall hired to be the penguins gm with no preconditions about personnel decisions large or small that's according to an, an individual directly involved in the hiring process and one who's never lied to me in a lifetime of knowing this individual. Neither Hexel nor any other candidate was told they'd have to keep the core of Crosby, Malkin, or Latang, and they also weren't told that they'd have to move one or more. So what this is about is you bring Hexel in. I guess the story was people thought that Hexel was chosen because he wanted to break up the core. Um, I guess, Danny, does that make sense to you? The, that that's what Hextel wanted to do, and that's why he was brought in. Dan's what Dan has is that's not true. So I guess I'm going to talk about. But. Yeah, and the other thing to keep in mind there, one like that that was previous ownership, so this wasn't even under Fenway Sports Group. But right. the other the other thing is that why like I I just don't understand where supposedly from what we we know and from what Dayan wrote is that it was Hextall and basically nobody else for the, the GM job anyway. Right. There was one other candidate. There's one other candidate, New York, Chris Drury, and they didn't even have permission to talk with him. Right. And it, this is, this wasn't like a typical GM search, like Rutherford walked out right after the season started. So it's not like you've got this fresh pool of Kyle Dubases that just got, that didn't have their contract renewed at the end of the season. No, this was a much different circumstance. Yeah, because, like you said, you know, you're typically looking at assistant GMs um, from other teams for these kind of openings. And midseason, you're not going to get permission from a lot of those guys. Dan has that um, uh, in here, too. There's a bullet. Uh, the one candidate who had been a main target for the Penguins, Chris Drury of the Rangers, never even got the chance to communicate with the Penguins since the request was denied. Uh, so Hextall was chosen because he was an, available. Um, there, there, there really weren't any other names floating around at the time. Um, Hextall, he was an, an advisor, seemed like an okay candidate at the time. His drafting with the Flyers was okay. You figured the Penguins were going to go into a rebuild eventually. He, he was around for a championship with the Kings in that advisor role. Um, I, I don't think it was something like Hexel was like, yeah, I want to break up the core. Um, and then yeah, that just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Like what about doing that makes an entire role or job enticing? Like nobody's yeah. like, Ooh, I'm just, I'm, I'm going to take this job because I get to blow up the core mm -hmm. and then fill it up with crappier players. What? You know what this is? This is the narrative that Hexel was the flyer. Um, that's something yeah. that the fans repeat. It's like, Oh, Hexel was a flyer. I wanted to come in ruin the penguins mind you hextall grew up a penguins fan in pittsburgh uh, <laughs> he was a penguins fan before he was a flyer um uh, another thing was more so it sounded uh, before it was reported that morehouse uh was the one that wanted to 
um, the story was like, okay, Morehouse was the one that wanted to blow up the core. So he brought in Hextall to do that. But then ownership changed and ownership was like, no, you can't blow up the core. Then Morehouse is like, I'm out. I'm going to the Steelers. Um, day in has in here. Morehouse was never making hockey decisions. Um, the MO with groups of the old ownership is that um, Lemieux and Burke will talk to Rutherford and Morehouse would listen, piping up only when needed, which makes Morehouse was not like a hockey guy. Um, he was the president, but he's, he's not like, he didn't have like a hockey background before. As I can't imagine he was making many hockey decisions or right. forcing people to listen to his. Um, let's see. A lot of hearing about like Hextall, who he reported to. Um, it sounded like, so I, I, I had said this, Hextall was regularly communicating with Fenway. We knew this a while ago. And Fenway has had someone in Pittsburgh for much of the season. Um, Dayan has in here, Hextall was hearing from and answering to far more voices than any GM ever should, GM ever should hear over his head. He was taking calls on a regular basis, not only from Burke, uh, but also from three different people at Fenway, John Henry, principal owner, um, Tom Warner, he's the chairman, and then Dave Beeston. Dave Beeston is the representative that's in Pittsburgh. Um, Dan says he can't know what those calls might have been about, but I can only concoct so many reasons for a team owner to call a hockey GM if it's not a hockey matters. And no, he's not dropping a hint on, on the source. That That's something that um, stood out to me is that it seems like there's too many voices at Fenway, if why are there three different people communicating with Hexel on a regular basis? Um, I feel like there should be one voice there, like one united voice. Are they all telling him different things? Because that can be confusing. And if Hexel doesn't know which one he actually reports to, that's that's not good. Yeah, no, that that's a problem. But I also wonder if they were. <laughs> I guess I'll use the term hands on here with him because he wasn't their hire and you know, that they, Fenway didn't really have a hockey background or anything. So I can at least understand kind of riding it out with the guy, the previous ownership hired just to see how he was doing um, because they maybe didn't know any better, but that, that might explain why they had so many hands on with him at all times because they, you know, he wasn't their guy. So they wanted to make sure that they were staying in touch with him and knew everything that was going on. Yeah. And I, this also runs counter to like previous, uh, I guess you can say reports or, you know, thoughts that the people at Fenway in Boston don't care at all. You know, that's something the fans repeat. Like, do they even know they own a hockey team? You go to their website. I, they're on, the Penguins are on their website now. But if John Henry and Tom Warner were frequently in Hextall's ear, even though they, they only came to Pittsburgh a couple times since buying the team, um, I guess it's a good thing that they're involved or that they know they own a hockey team. But, right. again, Dave Beeson is the guy on the ground. Um, he was around for much of the season. We would see him uh, practices in, in the management box. He was traveling with the team a lot. Um, so – not much more to talk about here. Just interesting to learn um, some of the dynamic between Hexall ownership um, and uh, I guess some of the reasons or non-reasons for, for Hexall's hiring. Um, and in Oz, like I said, good to clear Teddy's name that he wasn't on his phone during a dinner. He's not that rude. <laughs> <laughs> That's what yeah. I cared about the most. <laughs> I, I would just encourage everybody, like if, if you're reading certain things and you have to ask yourself how the heck the person or people that wrote that, how the heck they got that information, that should probably give you enough skepticism right then and there to know what you're reading. Um, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, we're going to take another break. We're going to come back. Uh, we're going to talk about Yager. So stay with us. All right. And we are back. Some big news last week. I feel like this would have been a bigger deal if we had not been wrapped up in a in a GM surge and, and that news. But Yager was in town. Uh, he was not the only 90s penguin to be in town. So there was a signing in uh, Monroeville. I believe it was Monroeville. Um, it was like a card expo type thing where, you know, you pay money, go, you get to autograph signing, meet these guys. Um, Paul Coffey was in town with Tom Barrasso, too. 
Uh, but Yager, especially for for him to come over, just I, there have been a lot of, I guess, questions about like you know what his relationship is, is like with the Penguins because they obviously left on bad terms. Um, he's spoken before in the past, like years ago, like back when he was in like New Jersey, about you know how he and Mario didn't have much of a relationship anymore. But you know, so he was in, in town for the signing. The next day, he's at PPG Paints Arena getting a tour led by Kevin Ackland, president of business operations. Um, he got his jersey, a little framed uh, newspaper. He's in the locker room. And and every picture you see of the guy, he's just got the biggest smile on his right. face. Like you you could tell the guy was yeah. pretty damn thrilled to be back in Pittsburgh and at the arena. Yeah. So I. I I reached out to someone in like the the front office that day and like what is Yager doing there? Like obviously you know the card signing what's he doing there for, for this? And the response I got back was um he's cashing in on old chili gold tickets um <laughs> but he's just visiting just visiting. Uh, I think this is a good sign that Yager's relationship with the Penguins is healed. Um his number is going to get retired eventually. This sounds like especially a more of a passion project of Acklin. Um, Acklin grew up a Penguins fan and Acklin. Uh, I know he called Yager in the Czech Republic earlier in the year, like back in uh, October, November, just to talk about, you know, the city and how the city feels about Yager and how Penguins fans have forgiven Yager at this point for the most part. Um, Acklin sent Yager a Robo Penguin jersey, and Yager posted a video of him in the Robo Penguin jersey. Um, Yager, by the way, before he left Pittsburgh, he posted a picture on Instagram that said, I'll be back. Seems like it's only a matter of time before his jersey gets retired. It's happening. Yeah, it's it's 100% <laughs> happening, and I wouldn't even be surprised maybe if it ends up happening this season, or at least maybe they were like talking about that or planning that out while he was here. I can't imagine that, you know, they, they got the frame Jersey for him and they're walking him around the locker room and it, it, that kind of conversation. Cause the, the Penguins absolutely do want to retire his Jersey. Like we, that, that much is clear. I just can't imagine having him in that environment and not even at least trying to set something up or, or figuring out a time and date when they might be able to do that. Obviously they don't have the NHL schedule for this season, but it's like, Hey, you know, this two week window, if we have a home game on this Thursday night kind of thing, I don't know. I don't know how those things work, but it, it would just boggle my mind if that didn't, that didn't come up in conversation while he was there. Well, the issue is that he's still playing. <laughs> um, he owns the team in the Czech Republic. Cladno. He plays for Cladno. And that was, you know, the the point people would make before is like he can't come over mid season for a for a jersey retirement ceremony when he has his own games. Now, you look at his last season; I, he didn't make his season debut with Cladno for I want to say uh, it, it was a little bit into the season, maybe like two months. Um, and but he mostly played in most games after that, so I don't know if that's something he'd want to do. Um, again, where maybe he doesn't play in the beginning of the season and then, you know, early fall here, this coming season, he comes over or I don't know. He can't play forever. Right. I don't, I don't know. At this, <laughs> at, at this point, I'm just assuming he's continuing forth until he doesn't. Well, yeah. Cause what he's talked about is, um, I mean, that's just such a big sponsorship draw for clap for the team. Um, is having him still still play for them, and he cares about right. that as the owner. That's something he's spoken about before. He's also spoken a bunch of times, like even going back to when he was still in the NHL, and people were like, why are you still playing? He, he would say it's because he doesn't want to get fat. Um, and he's like, I know what happened if I stop playing. Like, I'm going to get fat. Uh, there, He did an interview with ESPN when he was with Florida, and he said he eats seven, eight muffins a day. And he's like, I know what would happen if I stop playing because I'm eating all these muffins. And it's like, Yager, you could eat fewer muffins. <laughs> but no, but, y- yeah. Yags is not going to stop eating muffins. I respect or, or that. Or eat fewer muffins. <laughs> yeah, I respect that. He's like, I got to eat seven to eight muffins a day. So I have to just keep being a professional hockey player into my mid-50s. Um, <laughs> but... Just yeah, builds I don't... on top of the legend. Yeah, if if not next this coming season, maybe the the following one. 
Um, I, I can't imagine he actually has that much more uh, time left in him playing uh, over there. You look at you know his role, it w- he was like a fourth line guy. Sometimes he was on the top line, but it was more so like a power play role, and he's not really moving around a lot there on a power play. I don't, I don't have his numbers in front of me. He did put up points. He was scoring. No, I, I don't have his exact numbers, but there was, there was a point in time I remember somebody just like, I don't even remember who it was, but somebody tweeted out one of his goal videos. I was like, let's go look at Yogg's stat line just to see how he was doing. It wasn't anything crazy, but it was definitely more than you would expect from a guy his age. Yeah, I, I know he wants to play forever and the sponsors, sponsorships and all that. He's not actually going to play. He's 51. He turns 52 next year. Um, I, I can't imagine he has maybe two seasons left in him. So if, if he doesn't want to uh, – if he's not able to come over next season because of his Czech team, maybe we're looking at the following season for jersey retirement. Um, who re- who I, retires I, first? Who retires first, Yager or Crosby? I was just about to say, like, whose number, whose banner do we see go up into the Raptors first? Um, I, I, I don't feel like there's going to be much time between Yager's eventual retirement ceremony, Crosby, um, Malkin too. Malkin's going to end up there. I do have Yager. I did pull up Yager's numbers. Uh, he played. 26 games for Cladno this year, five goals, nine assists. So 14 points in 26 games. That's not bad. Um, hey, hey, if, if he's putting up those kind of numbers in professional leagues, well, those are my numbers in like beer league. Good for him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that, and that's, that's the top Czech league. Um, uh, and so last year, his team's not that great. Um, this, the 21 22, he played 43 games. Uh, eight goals, eleven assists. Uh, they do a relegation system in in Czechia. The so they can move. So you know the there's a there's a tournament at the end of the season between the last the last place teams. Uh, the loser goes down to the second league. The winner of the second league comes up. Alger played in the qualification tournament. And helped save them from uh, relegation. So uh, and they didn't have to play in the relegation tournament this year but i don't know um do uh, uh, while we're on the topic of jersey retirement um mary is up there michelle is up there yager is going to be up there crosby malkin are going to be up there latang yeah i think you have to just because like him crosby and malkin all staying together for so long like their entire careers i don't know how you exclude him from that in different circumstances i don't know that you would probably put a i don't know that you'd put a guy like Latang's number up in the rafters i mean it, it, it's it's easy to say that because it's the penguins right but if, if Latang had the exact same career playing with the blue jackets they would have a statue of him outside so it, it's really hard to tell but i i think you got to put Latang up there with him Teams are getting lax with the statues. Pecorino. Dustin Brown. <laughs> Dustin Brown. I was there for that. Worst, worst on site event coverage <laughs> of my young journalism career. Terrible. Yeah. I mean, like, if, if, and again, Pecorino, greatest predator ever, uh, did a lot for the community, but he hasn't won something. I feel like when, like, the teams like that that are putting up statues for guys like that, once they actually, I don't know, get good, win championships, it's going to look goofy that you have a Pecorino statue. Yeah, like, at least if, Dustin if, Brown won something. Right. Like, the Penguins, well, we say that the Penguins have a statue of two Islanders out front, so maybe we're dumb. Um, the Mario statue. Yeah. It's only 33% Mario. Two-thirds of it is not Mario. Um what happens with the statues then? Do Crosby, Malkin, Latang get one together? I don't know. That's so tough. Well, the other thing is, where would they even put the other statue? The you know, one of the last games of the season, I I had that thought as I was walking uh, down. There's like a big open space down by the People's Gate, like where we walk in for the media entrance. There's like that kind of like a hill. Um, 
right to the to the left of that that fan entrance. I feel like that's where the statue is gonna go because again, the Mario and the Islanders statue take, takes up so much space. That it's so crazy that that's what they went with for Mario statue. Like if you're looking at uh, for a play of him splitting the D, that's not even the one that comes to mind. No. A lot of people think that's the North Stars goal. It's not. No, it's not. It's the Islanders. It's the Islanders. <laughs> um, I don't know what Crosby, Malkin, and Latang would you, if you do one of them together, them holding the cup. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That said, if <laughs> if for whatever reason it just ends up being Crosby, do they give him a statue where he's down shooting on one knee? Do they have him wheeling or kneeling from his <laughs> backhand? Do we get the goal celebration from his concussion return? Like, oh, yeah, there's a man. lot of good options if we're just ISO and Crosby here. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like if you if you if you put Crosby, uh, yeah, you would have to put a Malkin one up too. And if you're doing that, you kind of have to include Latang yeah. in that. Um, so, I think it'll be the three of them, and I, my guess would be down by the People's Gate. Um, hopefully, no Islanders included in that. No other players, because again. <laughs> There are three players with statues outside of the arena right now. Two of them are New York Islanders. That's a wrap on this this week. Uh, Again, hopefully next week we'll have some serious GM news to talk about. I feel like they're going to have a higher by our next episode. We drop episodes every Saturday. Uh, Anywhere you listen to podcasts, Spotify, Apple, Google, you can find us. Uh, We also have a video version on the DK Pittsburgh Sports Penguins YouTube that's our channel for only penguins content so subscribe to us there if you want want to watch this if that's your thing but thanks again for sitting through this one and uh we hope you join us next week